Well, obviously not. There is still something. Secondly, I quoted Christopher Isham to point out that even if there is no material cause of the origin of the universe, you still need to have a productive cause to bring the positive and negative energy into being, and he doesn't deny the point. Thirdly, I argued that if uh, Dr. Atkins really is saying that nothing exists, then this is self-evidently absurd, because I at least exist, and that's undeniable. If he backs off and says, however, no, there is something now, then the argument comes into play that if there is something that whatever begins to exist therefore has a cause. There must be a transcendent cause of the universe. And I argue that this cause must be timeless, changeless, immaterial, and personal. None of those arguments were ever attacked tonight. So I don't think that Dr. Atkins has succeeded in proving that God does not, uh, or the, rather that my arguments fail to show that God exists. Uh, on the contrary, all he's offered is a self-contradictory alternative, uh, metaphysical mumbo-jumbo about mathematical points coming into existence and bringing space and time into being, uh, an account which simply cannot be true. Secondly, what about the complex order in the universe? I argued, number one, that the uh, fine-tuning of the initial conditions is due to either law, chance, or design. Secondly, I argued that it's not due to law or chance. I pointed out that his uh, reasoning to try to show it could be by chance was simply based on an incorrect analogy concerning the lottery. He didn't deny the point. I gave four reasons why the God hypothesis is superior to the many worlds hypothesis. He didn't offer any refutation of any of those. And finally, I argued that there is no theory of everything that would show that in addition to natural laws, that these initial conditions and quantities are uh, physically necessary. So that the design hypothesis is really the only explanation that seems to be tenable. There is an intelligent designer of the world. Thirdly, I argued that the presence of objective moral values points to God. We agreed that if God does not exist, then objective moral values do not exist. But I argued, secondly, that it's evident that there are objective moral values. Remember John Healy's statement about torture, government-sanctioned murder, what the Nazis did in the Holocaust, ethnic cleansing in Bosnia, the killing fields of Cambodia. It seems to me that it is evident that there is really right and wrong. And if that is true, and if you agree with that point with me tonight, then you will agree with me that therefore God exists. Fourth, as to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, Dr. Atkins simply said that uh, we shouldn't believe the uh, messenger. We should always disbelieve the messenger rather than believe the miracle. And it seems to me that this uh, is simply an incorrect and fallacious argument. The hypothesis that God raised Jesus from the dead is not improbable. What is improbable is that Jesus rose naturally from the dead. And I would agree with him that any hypothesis is more probable than that. Conspiracy, illusion, lying, anything is more probable than that the cells of Jesus' body all spontaneously came back to life again. But that's not the hypothesis. The hypothesis is that God raised Jesus from the dead. And I don't think he's shown that that is improbable. Indeed, given the specific evidence agreed to by the majority of New Testament historians, I think that it is quite probable that, in fact, Jesus rose from the dead. R.T. France, who is a New Testament scholar at Oxford, makes the following point. He says, ancient historians, Greco-Roman historians, have sometimes commented that the degree of skepticism with which New Testament scholars approach their sources is far greater than would be thought justified in any other branch of ancient history. So that when you look at these New Testament historians, they are extremely skeptical about their sources, and yet they have been compelled to agree to the empty tomb, the resurrection appearances, and the origin of the disciples' faith. And I know of no plausible naturalistic explanations for those facts. Finally, number five, the immediate experience of God. Dr. Atkins says, well, this is just a self-delusion. Well, I invite him to prove this. Will he appeal to Freudian psychology? This is clearly uh, jaded and out of, out of date. What will he do to prove that it's delusory? Uh, until he can give me some reason to think God doesn't exist, why should I think my experience of God is delusory? In fact, I, I myself wasn't raised in a church going home or in a Christian family. But as a teenager, I began to ask the big questions in life about the meaning of my existence, the purpose of life. 
And in the search for answers, I began to read the New Testament. And as I did, I was captivated by the person of Jesus of Nazareth. There was a, an authenticity about this man, a ring of truth about what he said that gripped and captivated me. And to make a long story short, after about six months of the most intense soul searching, I just came to the end of my rope and I cried out to God. I experienced a sort of spiritual rebirth in my life and God became an immediate reality to me. A reality which has never left me as I've walked with him day by day over the last 30 years. And I want to encourage you as I conclude tonight that if you're seeking for God in that same way, you do the same thing I did. Pick up the New Testament, begin to read it and ask yourself, could this really be true? I believe it could change your life just as it changed mine. Dr. Atkins. Well, I'm used to hearing travesties of the arguments that I presented, and that was, I think, a pretty fair travesty of um, what I actually said. Um, let, let me take the points in order, and I will accept um, Dr. Craig's order, just for sake of convenience. The origin of the universe. I do not believe that one can extend the concept of causality to a, a an era prior to the existence of time. It is simply primitively naive to talk about uh, 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 causality outside the domain of time. So I will not accept that, that, I, that the universe had to, to be caused. It's an entirely different mode of coming into operation which we scientists do not yet know but which we will find out and we are on the track of it. I think um, the question of complex order, it was also a travesty of my argument about, um, about probabilities. If something can happen, then it may happen. If something is very, can happen only with very remote possibility, then it is possible that if the universe is replicated, and I'm not talking about parallel universes, this is quite a, 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 um, a, a wrong uh, ascription to, to my argument. I'm talking about the possibilities of many universes actually existing, each of them with a particular mixture of fundamental constants. And it is also wrong to assert that this is outside the domain of physics. If one looks at modern cosmology, modern theories of cosmogenesis, and in particular inflation theory, and in particular the, um, the possibility of fractal infl inf inflation theories, then it is exactly that kind of multiple universe which is being seen as a possibility of occurring at the beginning of, um, of everything that we call the current universe. So science is showing that that kind of multiple universe can come into existence and indeed at this very instant there may be universes coming into existence. It is impossible and improper to deny the power of what science is revealing, even though science may be revealing extraordinary things, on the basis of homespun philosophies and familiarity with what goes on in one's backyard. Science is exposing a much more subtle basis to the universe than can be dreamt up in the farmyard. I don't believe, the words have been put into my mouth that I am destroying the value of meaning of life. I deny that absolutely. I think that if one divests oneself of all the baggage that one has been brought up with and sees the world with the utter clarity that science provides, and knowing that one has a brain that if one is only prepared to use it, can lead to a comprehension of the world. That is an extraordinary achievement, and I can do that without any help from God. My central point, though, my central point is that it is up to believers to prove, to prove explicitly that my bony view of the world, bony in the sense that it's very simple, starkly simple, is an inadequate theory of all there is. You 
that before you can move on to the stage where you say, ah, it must be God who did it. Ah, it must be God who caused it. Ah, it must be God who gives us morals. Ah, it must be God who got Jesus out of the tomb. What you have to do is to prove beyond any doubt that the simple view that all this can happen through the agency of physical law, you have to prove that that is inadequate. I have not heard that tonight. All I have heard is the assertion that God is there doing it. And I think that that is a dereliction of the power of human comprehension and an abnegation of the human intellect. I think we ought to give praise not to the Lord, thank goodness, but praise to ourselves that over the centuries, and particularly the last 300 years as we brought scientific observation, mathematical rigor to bear on our analysis of events in the world, that we have got within an inch or two of understanding the great problems that have puzzled people through the ages. I am proud to be alive at this part of the 20th century, where I am on the brink of understanding everything. And I commend you to use your brains, because your brains are the most wonderful instruments in the universe. And through your brains, you will see that you can do without God. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are, we're now going to have questions from the floor. So let's have a question for Dr. Craig. Uh, who would like to ask Dr. Craig? Yes, sir. Dr. Craig, uh, Eddie Tabash from Beverly Hills, California. You mentioned in your opening speech about the importance of miracles in Jesus' ministry. And apparently you did so to demonstrate his need to give an evidentiary proof of his divinity beyond the laws of nature, otherwise why would he perform miracles? If our entire salvation is dependent upon accepting Jesus, why does God act in such a hidden fashion today? Why not 2,000 years later give us miracles, part a few oceans, uh, fire and brimstone a few cities, maybe a few flaming chariots? If we needed 2,000 years ago supernatural evidence to believe supernatural things, why is God so stingy today in denying us that same supernatural evidence, considering that so much rides upon it? Well, I would agree with uh, the French philosopher uh, and mathematician Blaise Pascal when he said that God has given evidence sufficient for those with an open mind and an open heart, uh, but it's sufficiently vague so as not to compel those whose hearts are closed. Certainly, God could write in sky writing across the sky, uh, I exist, repent or perish, uh, something of that sort. Or uh, on every atom, he could uh, write created by God. Vote Republican. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I, I don't think that uh, God's under any sort of obligation to offer these kinds of coercive evidences. I think that the evidences he have, has given are sufficient for someone who's willing to look at them with an open mind and an open heart. And I would add this other point, too, is that although I haven't talked about this very much tonight, I think that the primary uh, way in which we know God exists is not through these evidences, but it is through this immediate experience of God himself, the fifth point that I talked about. For those who are genuinely seeking God, I believe God will make his existence evident to them. So there is a sort of interior way to, to God in addition to these but that, exterior proofs. Do you want to comment on that, Dr. Yes, Hensley? but that's exactly my point, that people are desperate to see the truth of miracles. They stand back and they do not apply the normal laws of logic and evidence. They simply want to believe, and therefore they will believe anything. And a, a question, please, for Dr. Atkins. Dr. Atkins, uh, philosopher from Scotland, David, David Hume, pointed out that uh, 
We, as human beings, don't really have any rational basis for believing in the uniformity of nature, that the future will be like the past. Dr. Atkins, as a, Christian, I can, as a Christian, I can believe that the future will be like the past or that nature is uniform because I believe that God created the universe and this universe reflects the un uniformity which God has imposed upon it through his governing. I'd like to ask, in the atheistic worldview, the presupposition that there is no God and that all we have is matter in motion, what is your basis for believing that the future will be like the past?